Okay. If you if you want to look up on the screen, I'll shh, guys. Yeah, thank you. I'm recording a video right now. Yeah, I'm going to show you guys how to use a film camera. You're hearing you're hearing the echo because my, my sounds uh, my voice is being picked up by this camera and put on. Uh, I could actually take that off. That is distracting. There we go. That better? Okay. Um, this is a, ba a really basic film camera. There's no like extra features on this camera whatsoever. There's not even a light meter on this camera. Now some of your old film cameras will have light meters. Um, some of them could, e if you get ones in the 90s or the late 80s, they can either ha even have autofocus. This camera is auto nothing. Okay, it's completely manual. It doesn't take any batteries. Um, I like these cameras because you can get really, li uh, really good lenses and the camera's really compact. And I don't mind that it's manual because I'm a photographer, I know how to operate a manual camera. So um, this is a kind of a quick instructional video just to show you how to load it, how to use kind of the basic functions of it. Um, so go ahead and, uh, on this camera, the, the bottom opens up, and I could show you on different cameras too. So I could show you a more traditional camera enough so this one this one comes apart as like a clamshell so you twist these two things and the back comes off and you and you load film into there how's it going no okay um, this one is more traditional. You usually pull up the rewind, this is a rewind knob right here, and you pull it up and the back pops open like that. And you would load film the same way on both cameras. Just the, just the way the back opens up is a little different. Now I want to pretend like I put film in here now. I will, I will actually put film in, but I'll do it last so I don't waste my film um, while I'm actuating the shutter and whatnot. Um, this side is where the film leaves the camera, um, or leaves the, the little film cassette. That's what you buy in the store, has film in it. Then it gets transported across to the other side, and then the shutter opens and exposes it to light. That's basically how it works. And you take that, you, you could develop yourself, it's black and white, it's pretty easy to actually develop yourself. Or if it's color, you could take it to a store that, that does um, uh, color film processing. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. We could do, we could do that. Um, I have a bunch of stuff to do developing, so we can even we can even go into the lab and and do that. You don't even need to dark to do the film part. We use daylight um, uh, daylight bags to change the film into a uh, um, into a developing tank that's daylight, and then we pour the chemicals into the tank that's light proof, and you develop it like that. So that's that's pretty fun. I I really enjoy that. There's nothing better than to open up that tank and rinsing out the stinky fixer and pulling it out and see what your negatives look like. It's like the coolest. And it never goes away. Like I've done a thousand of them and it's still really cool. To, especially if you're really excited about the picture. Like you think, hey, this really came out cool. And then, then you can't wait to see what you got. It's almost like Christmas. Okay. Um, so pretend like I just loaded the film. Again, it's, it's pretty similar to this, uh, to this camera. Just on this one, it comes apart into two pieces. Okay. Um, now on this this camera, this is a lot more traditional what you're going to experience. So you would um, after you, uh huh. After you um, loaded the film. You'll shoot two blank frames because basically some of the film that, that came out of the, of the film container, the cassette, has been exposed by light. So you want to get that out of the way. So you, you shoot with the lens cap on, two blank frames, and then uh, you're cocked and ready for the, the third. The third frame is the one that you're going to actually expose and take a picture of. 
Now the settings on here, um, you have two settings that control the amount of light that hit the film. There's the, the shutter speed. And there's like, do you guys see the little red dot right here? Yeah, so that, that tells you what shutter speed you're set with. And this is a fraction of a second. Attention students, will Daniel Sacedo please report to the reception office? Daniel Sacedo, please report to the reception office. Thank you. Okay, this, these numbers right here are a fraction of a second. So which one do you think is the fastest? You're funny, John. So, so the one one, the one one thousandth is the fastest. So if you were doing, um, yeah, when there's a lot of light. So when I'm in bright sunlight, that's that's the one I'm using. And there's two ways to control the amount of light. There's also the iris, which is like a little in your eye. Have you guys seen inside your eyeball? Like if it gets really bright, the little hole in your eye will get smaller. That's called the iris. And these cameras, these cameras have an iris inside of them. Let's see if you can see it in the, um, in the document camera here. You see it get smaller? Yeah. Now let me turn it down to um, F16, which is the smallest opening. Check it out. See how small that gets? You guys see that? Yeah. So <clears throat> on this camera, the, the lower the number, the smaller the number, the bigger the hole. Okay? So F2.8 is the most light that you can let in on this particular lens. Now they're different depending on the lens and usually the lower the number the more expensive the lens is. This lens even though it was made in 1957 is still expensive because it has a low F number. This is a like a, about a $200 lens. Mm. And you read it right here. You guys see it? F1.5 so that one's two, two stops lower than the other one. And each stop, each little mark here is um, half the light. So this lens gathers four times the light of this, this lens right here. And then you can close it down more. And this one will stop all the way down, let's see if you can see it, to F22, which is a tiny little hole. You see it? Wow. Yeah. Oh, why do I do that for you? Is the biggest one like nighttime? Or? Yeah. I would use it, um, um, like at the football game, I used this camera, the first football game. Or no, it was a, a rally. Mm -hmm. It was a, um, not a rally, what do you call it? Scrimmage game. I didn't want to, I didn't feel like bringing my whole camera outfit so I just brought this to take a, a couple candid shots mm -hmm. and I opened it up all the way on the football field and it still allowed me to use a, a, a fairly fast shutter speed so I was using I think I was using 1 60th on the field it's harder to see on this camera if you try to go um, faster will it just not let you push down no if you try if you try to go faster and it's dark the pictures will come out underexposed so they'll be kind of really faint and not have a lot of detail. And um, if you overexpose it, yeah, it, film is more forgiving, uh, overexposing film. A uh, digital camera, if you overexpose a digital camera, it just goes completely white. It looks really ugly. Film, uh, especially black and white film, you can overexpose it a lot and it still come out. The, the, the frame looks really dark, but there's still information on it. Like you'd still be able to print it. Take it easy. Okay. Adios. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we covered the shutter speed, the the f stops, 
Okay, that's how to control light on your camera. Now, as far as what to use, um, like I said, most modern, um, even film cameras have some kind of light meter on it, and it's going to depend on the, the actual camera. Um, it's going to tell you what settings to set it at. What I generally, when I shoot people, I like to stay around 2.8 as close as possible um, because that allows me to isolate the person from the background. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the person will be in focus, but everything else behind it will be blurry. If I go lower, um, it still works. The shot, a shot might not be quite as sharp and things get really blurry fast. Like if I do f1.5 and take a picture of his eyes, it's completely blurry by the time it gets to his ears. So the, the, the bigger that opening, the, the more selective the focus is. The smaller the opening, the more everything is in focus. Like if I go to F22 and I'm outside on a bright sunny day, everything is going to be in focus. She's going to be in focus all the way to the football fields and even the mountains will be in focus. So at F22, it's almost infinite depth of field. Like everything becomes a focus. And that's the problem with like your little digital cameras is that they have such a, a small opening that everything is always in focus and you can't do selective focus with those cameras. I mean, I don't know if you've tried, but you, it's, it's really hard to get the background to be blurry on a phone camera. Like you have to get like really close to the subject, usually just close enough to maybe see their eyeball only and then maybe the background will be a little bit blurry. But these cameras give you a lot of control of depth of field. And my giant camera that I took the big group picture out in the field, that has the most control. I can, I could, even somebody far away, I can blur out the background still. And it's really a cool look, take it easy. It's a really cool look that you can achieve with that camera because no other camera can I let the subject be so far away and still have the foreground blurry, blurry and the background blurry. And if I want the whole thing to be sharp, I just stop the iris down, make it a tiny little hole. But then at that point, the people have to stand still because making it that small um, makes the exposure time longer to compensate for the little tiny hole, the little opening. So like on that, um, the exposure might be a tenth of a second if I stop it all the way down, which is slow. But it needs to be on a tripod if it's going to be that slow. But that giant camera, you never shoot it off the tripod anyways. Mm -hmm. But these you can, I, I, um, I really like this camera because it's super heavy. And what, the, what do you think that enables me to do? Mm -hmm. hold, hold, exactly. It gives it a little more inertia so it doesn't, it's not wiggling around so much. So when I press the shutter release button, I can do it without moving the camera. On my other cameras, I have some lighter cameras. It's really hard to keep it from moving. And I could take a picture a uh, half second it, with the shutter open for a half second and it still come out pretty decent. Like I could be in a restaurant with my wife. Like an example was, um, it was my sister-in-law's birthday mm -hmm. and we went out to a fancy restaurant and our fancy restaurants lit brightly or dimly? Yeah, dim. So I just opened it all the way up and I just braced my elbows on the table and I just pressed it really slowly until it released and the picture came out. But it's, it's hard to do with a light camera because you pressing the button moves the camera. Um, let's see. So yeah, this one doesn't even have a wind knob. It just has a, a knob on the top. This is the most like basic Spartan camera that you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. But I like it. It really, it's, there's nothing to break on it. There's no batteries to run out. The only thing that could go bad is if it was like super, super cold, it could maybe the it could start to get sticky and not function correctly if it was like freezing, totally freezing outside. But I do have a camera that's even good. Um, it was designed to not have any, any oil inside the camera. So it works all the way way below freezing. And it's a camera that uh, somebody that was going up to the mountains, like to Mount Everest, they would still take film camera. Why do you think that is? Why do you think they'd take a film camera to Mount Everest? Because the batteries. Yeah, the batteries don't work after you get below freezing. Those lithium ion batteries especially. Oh, wow. So, yeah, film camera, this, this, has no, this has no electronics in it. It's all clockwork in this thing. Mm -hmm. This has a light meter in it. I don't think the light meter works in this one, though. Does it? Yeah, it does. 
I don't even know where to put the battery on this guy. Oh, right here. It takes a battery. But the battery is only for the light meter. Now, I'll give you a couple of guess, um, guess spots. Um, if, if it's bright and sunny outside, you can always use this, um, this little rule of thumb. It's called the sunny 16 rule. If you put the iris on 16, right there, then um, the shutter speed just needs to be set as the, to the closest film speed. So if you have 400 speed film in there, you put it on, take it easy, you would put it on um, 500 speed. Right there, and this camera, like I said, it's kind of hard to see it, but it'd be on 500 speed if I put 400 speed film in there. That would take perfectly exposed pictures in broad daylight. And then indoors, I just put it on my 2.8 that I like, and I'd slow it down to about 60 if I had 400 speed film in there. And all the rest I'd guess in between of all the other settings. There's a lot of stops in between. Um, I changed um, two stops on the shutter speed, and I changed one, two, three, four, five stops on the iris to come indoors. So a total of seven stops different between um, the outside light and the indoor light. Now if I go in the shade, depend on the kind of shade, um, the shade would be three stops in really bright shade to four stops in kind of darker shade. So that, that'll kind of, that kind of gets you an idea of like um, what the lighting's like. And if it's, if it's real subdued light, um, like inside your house, if your house is not real brightly lit, then it, I would open it all the way up to like F2 and drop it down to like a 15th of a second. But then you have to hold it really still not to get a blurry picture. But that's kind of an eyeball or a kind of a basic way to um, judge exposure without using a light meter. Um, but I could show you on another time how to, how to use a light meter. Now, I told you I was going to show you how to load film um, on the last step here. So I just put this, put this link, my lens cap back on. Now this will be the same for any other camera. Um, just the only difference with this one is the clamshell instead of the back that opens up. This is the old school way. Cameras like this, like from the 50s and 60s, like open up back like that. In the 70s, they started opening up with a door. And I have a camera from the 40s, and the, the bottom comes off. Mr. Manny speaking. Yeah. Is Stephanie Martinez in here? No, no Stephanie. There's a few kids just left. All right. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, so let's go ahead and show you how to load the film. So that's what it looks like. This is 400 speed black and white film. Real easy to develop um, by yourself at home. And black and white film usually looks gray. A lot of them are gray on one side and kind of a green or like a, a, a different shade of gray on the inside. That's how you know it's black and white. If it was, if it was color film, what color would it be? Let's see if you guys know. Brown. It would be brown, yeah. Attention students, will Stephanie Martinez please come to the receptionist's office? Stephanie Martinez, please come to the receptionist's office. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. I, I knew. I, I mean, I'm explaining how to use a camera from scratch with somebody not knowing anything about it. So um, this is this is the uh, this is called the leader. You see how it's kind of cut here a little bit. Um, this is a take-up spool. Now on on most cameras, these don't come out, so you have to do it inside. I actually kind of like the fact that these come out because um, I could just fiddle with it like this, and these actually work really good. It has, this has a little tiny um, little spike that comes out or a little notch that comes out that grabs the film so it doesn't slip. Now that's a, that's a gotcha on a lot of cameras. If this slips out, you're going to be thinking you're taking pictures and not. And that, yeah, that sucks. That's not a good feeling. It hasn't happened too many times. I, mean, I think it's happened a couple of times. 
and went through a whole roll like that, but you learn really fast. There's a, something you can check on the camera. To, I'll show you. Um, there's something you watch on the camera to make sure, see it came out, to make sure that does, doesn't happen to you, and I'll show you what to look for. Uh, let, me, let me get this further inside. I can get that way in there so I don't have to worry about it slipping out. And this drops in on this one like such. And I I waste off shoot off a couple of frames here to make sure that you need, see these sprockets the teeth of the of this like little gear uh, looking thing right here need to engage the sprockets. Okay? If not it, it could tear your tear a little tear your film up. Um, this one is not dropping fully. There it goes. Now that's as far up as it'll go. So this looks like it's going to be okay. I'll go ahead and put the back on now. Okay, I'll go ahead and waste one shot with the cap on. And this is, I'm going to show you the little trick to make sure that you've done it correctly. This is a rewind, uh, the rewind um, knob to rewind the film back when you're done. This, most of them that you guys are going to get, they're going to look like this. What you do is you, you twist it until it gets just gets a little stiff. That means you've taken all the slack out of the film cassette in, that you've just loaded in. Don't twist it too much or you'll pull it off that take-up spool. So just to where it just gets a little snug. And then the next shot, watch what happens to the arrow. You see it turn? You keep your eye on that the whole roll. So every time you advance the film, make sure that thing is turning um, to let you know that your, your film is, has it come off. And usually it comes off in the beginning. Usually it doesn't come off like way into the roll. That's, I've never had that happen. But it, it, it could come off right in the beginning because there's nothing there to kind of hold it, hold it still. And I'll waste that other shot. And on most cameras, it's got a film camera a counter that every time you open up the back, it resets to zero. So you're good to go on that. And it usually has the waste uh, the shots, the wasted shots already included in the counter. See it just reset itself. You don't. Mm -hmm. So it says start, and then it has a couple dot uh, red ones. That's telling you, you need to waste a little until you get it on. And then you get it on one, the first um, white dot in there instead of the red dot. So that's no, pretty normal what you see. This one, you have to actually reset it manually. So I have to take my thumb and put it on, put it on zero. And that'll tell me how many shots I, I've taken inside. So the camera's ready to shoot. Like I said, I could put it on, oh, let's do two. F-125, turn the lights on. Who wants to be in a picture? You do? Okay. Thanks for being a good sport. So then what I would do is focus the camera. Focus on, if you're taking a picture of a person, you guys are hiding that they're funny. You focus on their eyeballs. That's, that's the way you take a picture of a person. Focus on their eyeballs and everything else will be blurred out. Now it's really going to be really shallow, and it'll be a really nice look. Now you guys will be super blurred, probably wouldn't even be able to recognize you in the, in the shot. Digital's good because if you have a digital camera that you can set on manual modes, you can see what, what you got right there on the spot, and if you uh, made a mistake or not. Uh, so then I, on this particular camera, you have to actually cock it and get it ready for the next shot before you can change the shutter speed. But that's only true on these old um, Russian cameras and old German cameras that I have. All these, it doesn't matter. You can change it before and after. Um, this is called a Zorky, by the way. This is made in the Soviet Union. Um, let's see. Is there anything else I wanted to talk about? Oh, if you need to use a flash, there's the, um, there's the connection for the flash. This little bar is called a self timer. What it does is it allows you to get in the picture. So you can put the camera on a tripod. Let's see if this one has a self timer. It does. So 
Um, you'd cock the, uh, cock the uh, shutter release, set the timer, and press this little button right here. And it starts about a, anywhere from 10 to 15 second timer. You can go run and get in a group. And take, that takes your shot for you. Um, another thing it's good for, if your camera has, um, these kind of cameras have a big mirror in it. And if you're taking a really nice landscape picture and you want it to be super, super sharp, um, some of the more professional cameras, see that mirror in there? Mm -hmm. You can lock the mirror up so that the mirror flapping doesn't shake the camera. And then what you would do to take a picture like that is you lock the mirror up once you've composed the shot and then use the self timer so that your finger is not moving the, the camera. Um, this one doesn't lock. Uh, um, I don't even think I have a key. I, yes, I do have a camera that has a mirror lockup. The FTB has a mirror lockup. It'd be different on every camera. This is not a, this is not a super common feature on a, a cheaper camera. Um, but what we, what you would do, you guys see the mirror, okay? Yeah. On this one, you move it over to the L. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think you push. No, that doesn't do that. There it is. You just move it over the M for mirror lockup. And so now if you take a picture with that locked up, the mirror doesn't, the mirror doesn't snap. The only thing that snaps is the, is the, the shutter. And you, you notice that's even quieter. Now let me put the mirror back down. A little, you see it flap around in there? Okay. There's also one more feature on these cameras I can talk about. Is this little button right here? It's called a depth of field preview. Mm -hmm. What it does is like if your iris is like stopped down to uh, a small size and you want to see how much stuff is going to be in focus, you can press this button and it'll make the iris get small so you can see what it's going to look like when you actually take the picture. But what it does is make the screen get dark because it's letting less light in. Because all these things allow you to focus with the iris all the way open, and then when the picture takes, um, the iris snaps down close to where you set it. So it allows you to get the maximum light and the, max le the least depth of field so you can focus better. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's about all. Did anybody have any, any questions? No questions? Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Now hopefully this video came out, I can upload it.